Hi everyone, I'm Larry. Today I want to talk to you about Pure Storage Active Cluster. This is our transparent failover RPO0 and RTO0 solution that enables you to build active active data centers. One of the first things I want to talk to you about is what you can see here on the left is we have a, a host represented by this box. The host is connected to a single Pure Storage flash array. Uh, this flash array in our simple example here just has one volume that's provisioned to connect to that host. And then up here at the top, we have uh, an application or a virtual machine. Uh, this can be either. We support uh, physical environments as well as virtual environments. So the first thing that we do in an active cluster environment to provision active cluster is obviously to add a second array to the configuration. OK, so we've got a second array in the environment. And then these arrays are going to be connected together uh, with a replication interconnect. And that works bi-directionally. Uh, I'm not going to draw the whole thing here, but so the arrays are both connected. We can replicate data in either direction. Um, one of the next steps for configuring and setting up Active Cluster is to take the volume or the volumes that I want to uh, be active active across these both arrays and put them into a management container that we call a pod. Um, so I'll draw the pod here and when we create this pod, the, after the pod's created, we can perform an additional step that we refer to as stretching. And this pod would be stretched across uh, to the array at the other site. And when we first perform this uh, stretch, what the pure storage arrays are going to do is actually use the asynchronous replication engine that we have, which is uh, maintains compression and is dedupe aware. And we're going to create a copy of this LUN over here on this array. So this LUN's created automatically. You don't have to provision each and every target LUN for the synchronous replication. OK, so once we've completed the stretch and the asynchronous transfer is done, uh, the arrays are going to transition into synchronous I.O. forwarding mode. So what that means is every write that comes into the system uh, from the host, that write's going to be synchronously forwarded to the array on the other side. And the other array is going to protect that write in NVRAM and uh, send the acknowledgment back to the first array that that write is complete. And only when this array has received the acknowledgment that the data is safely protected in NVRAM on both arrays will we acknowledge that write to the host. So that's what effectively creates the synchronous replication. Now, another thing is that this LUN that has been created over here has the exact same LUN serial number as the original LUN on this array. And what that means is that if we wanted to, we could simply take this same host and we could connect it to the array over here and expose this LUN to that same host. And from the host perspective, all it's really seen is that we've added more paths. So uh, this host would see a certain LUN serial number on this path. And the same host is going to see the same LUN serial number over here on this other path. Uh, so when the host uh, discovers all these paths, it's going to simply think that it has more paths to the LUN. And it's free to do I.O. both reads and writes on either side of the active cluster. Uh, so one cool thing about active cluster is that this very LUN here is both readable and writable. And the LUN on the other side is also both readable and writable. So in Active Cluster, there's no such notion as a passive LUN or a secondary LUN or a standby LUN. Um, and one of the cool things about Active Cluster is that um, you can, you may have guessed by this that once I've done this, once I've stretched the pod to the other array and I have a copy of all my data over here, uh, we also support what we call unstretching. So at this point, uh, if I wanted to, I could simply disconnect uh, this connection here. The, uh, the host would be using this connection to the other array to do all of its reads and writes. Uh, from a host perspective, that looks like it lost some of its paths, the same type of uh, path failure that would happen uh, if we were to fail over between the two controllers in a standalone flash array. Uh, and then I can unstretch my, uh, my pod from this array to that array. And I've effectively uh, transparently migrated a LUN from one pure storage flash array to the other.
But the real use case that we've implemented Active Cluster for is to be able to do site-to-site -site failover and allow customers to build active-active data centers across site. So let's say over here that this is going to be our site A. Uh, we'll call this guy host A. We'll call this array array A. And then over here at the other site, we're going to have another host right in the other site. Uh, so let's um, add that host here. Okay, so this is our, our host. We'll call this uh, site over here, site B. Um, this is gonna be host B, and then here we've got array B. Uh, so now we've got two sites, and um, we wanna do active active data centers, active active sites. So this host is gonna be connected to this array here, and this host is also gonna be connected across our uh, our SAN link, this can be iSCSI or fiber channel here in the middle. Uh, so this is what we call a uniform storage configuration. And, and the way I kind of remember it is that uniform means same everywhere. Uh, so the hosts are connected everywhere to every uh, storage array uh, in the environment. Uh, we do also support another configuration called non-uniform. And in a non-uniform configuration, host A would have access only to array A, so you'd only have this connection here, and host B would have uh, access only to uh, array B, so you'd have this connection here. And the main difference between these, these configurations is a couple of behaviors that you have in failure scenarios. So the difference between uniform configurations and non-uniform configurations is that you can imagine if this application or this virtual machine is running here in site A, and let's say array A were to fail, the application of the virtual machine would just keep running in place on host A, uh, but it would use this path over to array B. Um, so the host would simply experience a path failure here. It would keep using this path to the uh, array in the other site. The difference is if you were configured um, non-uniformly where only the outer two paths here existed, then if this array were to fail, um, you would rely on host clustering software to move this application or this virtual machine to a host in the other site where it could run on array B uh, from host B. And that's possible because remember, the LUNs uh, that exist here inside this active cluster pod have the exact same serial number, like I said. So host B believes that it is connected to the same exact LUN as host A is. So the host clustering software is simply going to do its job of failing over. So this might be a VMware vSphere uh, uh, HA cluster. It could be a Microsoft uh, cluster with SQL. This could be a virtual machine that VMware HA simply restarts over here on host B. Or this could be uh, a SQL instance that the SQL cluster moves from host A to host B because these paths are no longer available. Um, so that's kind of how some of the uh, interaction between active cluster and failover would work from a host perspective. Uh, but I'll talk more later about how we actually perform the failover. Okay, so let's talk about the paths that exist between the hosts and the arrays and how the hosts are going to use these paths. So in a real environment, there will be some distance between these arrays, right? Uh, maybe up to a millisecond or more of uh, distance between the arrays. They're in different sites, uh, spread across a metro area or something like that. So whenever host A is going to issue a write, we have to wait for the latency between the two sites uh, for that write to be acknowledged on the other array and the acknowledgement to be sent back and then confirmed to the host, uh, to the host that originally sent the write. Um, so our WAN latency is always going to be added to the write latency. Um, but if we're thinking about reads, there's really two paths that reads could take here. Any read that we do across this path is going to be a very low latency read. But any read that we happen to do on this path here to array B from host A, um, that would be a longer latency path, and we don't want to use that path uh, unless we have to, unless all these paths to array A has uh, failed, or unless array A itself has failed, then we would use those paths. Um, so to make sure this can be set up very effortlessly and um, it's easy to manage, we have this thing in the host that we call a preference. So on the host object inside the pure storage software, we would say that host A prefers array A, and over here on this array uh, for this host, we would say that host B prefers uh, array B. 
And this gives us a, a per host ability to configure what are the best paths for us to do all of our all of our I/O on. And another benefit to this means that um, I can take an application instance or a virtual machine, and I can do a uh, a V motion, and I can I can essentially move this virtual machine over here to the other site. Okay, so we've got our app um, or our VM. It's been uh, moved over here. This is just a simple V motion. It's not a uh, storage V motion. We didn't move any data or anything. The virtual machine is not running on this host anymore. Now it's running on host B over here at the other site. And uh, like I said before, uh, this could be an instance of SQL. So you could say, I want the instance of SQL that was running on the uh, Microsoft host at this site to instead be running on the Microsoft host at that site, which is effectively the same kind of migration. Um, it's really just a compute uh, cycle migration, right? So when the workload lands on this host, this host has its own preference setting, which says that host B prefers array B, and that means I'm automatically going to get all of my workload happening on these paths here, um, and I'm only going to pay for writes that go across the WAN. So I get exactly the same performance regardless of which uh, host I run my virtual machine on. So even though I can have multiple virtual machines running in the same data store, I can have a virtual machine uh, over here in site A that is running uh, in this data store, and I can have um, different virtual machines that are running over here in site B, but stored in the very same data store, and because the same LUN object is readable and writable on both sides, everybody gets the best performance. So you have VM level granularity of moving um, your uh, virtual machines between sites, and you don't have to really worry about affinity rules or anything like that to get the best performance. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, our LUNs are writable on both sides. They're active-active. There's no notion of a passive volume or a standby volume. If this were a standby or a passive volume, and I wanted to do that kind of migration that I just talked about, in order to get back to that point where I have good read performance, um, I would have to copy the data from one LUN to another. Uh, if this were a standby volume and I were to move that virtual machine, all of this virtual machine's reads would have to happen on this longer path to that site until I move the virtual machine out of this LUN and into a different one that was active at that site. Uh, but you don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff with Active Cluster because of the way we've architected it. Okay, so we've moved our virtual machine from site A to site B. Uh, I went ahead and got that out of the way here on the screen. So the next thing I want to talk about is how Active Cluster behaves in another failure scenario. So we have this replication interconnect between the two sites. This is the interconnect where all of our synchronous I.O. Uh, transferring back and forth happens. Um, anytime you have a solution that's active-active, you want to prevent a thing called split brain. Uh, split brain is a bad scenario where the arrays are both serving the same copy of data, uh, but they're not in sync, and that's very bad for any environment. So we want to avoid that. And the way any solution like this is going to avoid that is by having a third component to the cluster that helps mediate the failover between the two primary nodes in the storage cluster. And uh, with a pure storage solution, uh, we call that a mediator. And um, we're offering a mediator in the cloud for our customers um, in our pure one cloud. So uh, any pure storage flash array that is configured to phone home and can access our phone home systems automatically has a third site that you didn't have to provision that we can use for mediating failover between the two arrays. And the way failover mediation works is that if this link were to break here between the two arrays, all of the I.O. for only the volumes that are configured inside these uh, active cluster stretch pods, uh, the I.O. for those pods will uh, pause while the arrays negotiate the failover. And uh, internally here at Pure, we call this a race to the mediator. So once this interconnect uh, failure happens, both the arrays are going to race to the mediator, and the first one to get there is going to claim the ability to keep its volumes online, and the one that gets there last is going to have to take its volumes offline to prevent that bad split brain scenario that I talked about. So let's say the link here in the middle fails. Array A is going to race to the mediator. If array A happens to get there first, it's going to claim the right to keep its 
volumes online. If array B happens to get there second, the pure one cloud is going to know that array A has already claimed that right for this active cluster pod. And uh, IO service is going to continue here in the copy of the LUN on side A, and side B will go offline. Now, any, um, any volumes that are in a pod that is not stretched or any volumes that are outside of a pod that are just local pods for that array, they just continue running as if uh, nothing happened. So this failure scenario really only pertains to things that are in uh, stretched pods, and you can have multiple of these in your uh, environment. This is what enables all the transparent failover and all the RPO0 capabilities and RTO0 capabilities that we have in Active Cluster. And there's one more capability that I forgot to mention uh, that is also zero, and that's with Active Cluster, um, there are zero licenses. Uh, we don't do any software licensing in a pure storage flash array. Uh, so if you're an existing pure storage customer and you're running uh, our flash arrays, uh, this will simply be a non-disruptive upgrade for you. You'll upgrade to the newer version of Purity. Uh, you won't have to add any license or anything like that. You'll see these new capabilities in your software to be able to create pods, put volumes inside of pods, stretch them between arrays. We'll automatically use the Pure One Mediator in the cloud. If you don't have a third site, that's the best solution for you. Um, we're also offering a mediator that you can deploy as a virtual machine in your environment uh, if you're the kind of customer that doesn't have access to the cloud. So that's Pure Storage Active Cluster in a nutshell. Thanks for watching.